Eyes. Shogun Showdown. Uh, if you haven't played this yet, it's a great, great little title. You definitely owe it to yourself. Like I keep saying, video games is smoke and mirrors. 100% is. 100%. Absolutely. All right, let's check this out. So, Shogun Showdown. This is literally the entire game. These four, like, spots. So, whoa! Moth... Mothman Centaur. Centaurs are one of my second favorite mythological creatures, so that's good. But then you combine it with a Mothman, and now I'm deeply uh, disconcerted. But thank you for the follow. We're a charitable organization. By the way, I didn't say this when, uh, when we got raided. We are a charitable organization devoted to helping people figure out, uh, or, or rather develop the skill sets they need to enter the video game industry. And we're doing that right now for me and getting me to have some games released. But eventually, we're going to have cohorts of doing essentially long game jams with individuals looking to make career transitions and build their skill sets, where at the end of that time period, they will have a published game on Steam. So it's a community-driven thing. We're trying to make something that uh, really helps people. So, whoa, hey, kid. Okay, you, can you go talk to mom? Thank you, sweetie. All right, uh, what's the first favorite? The first favorite is Minotaurs. So, like, you got Tar in there. Centaurs are pretty rad. Mothman Centaur sounds like a Thor follower. <laughs> what game are we playing right now? This is Shogun Showdown. And I'm going to show you how this works here. It is very, very, very slick. This feels a little loud to me. I'm going to turn it down a little. Let me know if the volume isn't quite right. Oh, and there's there's the pirate emotes. Called it, Tom. All right. So, we're going to go to the first level. And our objective is to take down the Shogun. So, the way we do that is we have our uh, little game board here. This is essentially a board game that was turned into a video game. So... I can. These are all the controls for the game. Very, very simple. I'm going to turn this down even more because, boy, is it loud. Uh, so I'm going to turn myself around. Look, I am facing him now. That took one turn. Now he got a turn. He is going to turn around now. I can put on this arrow to say I should attack, and then I will press space bar to shoot that arrow. It will do two damage to him. He has two lives. He is dead. I can load up this next attack. Now my arrow is on cooldown. You can see these things down here. We're gonna do just a generic, this is how the game plays. Smack him. He loads up his sword. I'm gonna move backwards. Get my arrow loaded up. He is now going to attack. I'm gonna dash out of the way, load up my sword, and then reorganize these. And I can move forward. And if I hit spacebar, I will slash at this guy and then shoot a bow at the guy behind him. Slash, bow, done, combo. Now everything is on cooldown, so I need to kind of spend some time. But now here I'm in a problem, right? But I can dash back once again, and we're fine. Get our cooldowns up, grab my sword. Oops, he's going to slash again. Now watch this, this is interesting. He's going to slash, I'm going to step out of the way. And he hits in front and behind and kills his buddy. Or doesn't kill him, but he hurts him. So now I can hit spacebar, slash him, and shoot the bow behind him, and it's going to kill both of them. Once again, we got a combo. So you can see how this starts to become quite an intriguing little puzzle. And then you get these little potions you pick up on the ground. I can poison everyone. I can uh, reduce my cooldowns and everything. It's a good time. It's a very, very cute little puzzle. So we're going to get through this fight, and then we're going to start analyzing and figuring out how this thing plays because it's really, really good. We've been studying it a lot for the um, for the dog game to see, like, how do they make it feel polished? How do they make it feel good? We'll get to that. So I am going to pick up Knockback Punch or Dash. Hmm. It's free. I think we're going to go for Knockback Punch. You can knock people into each other, and that will deal a damage. So, I mean, you can see from an implementation standpoint, the basic mechanics of this game are very simple. This would be a pretty decent, like, beginning project, right? Uh, pretty cool for being so simple so far. Yeah, Jack, absolutely. It's a very simple and engaging puzzle. No physics probably helps polish. A hundred billion percent risky. That is my big learning I'm having working on this dog game. 
is if you are early on in your game dev uh, progress, don't do physics. Do something that does not require physics. So, to start off with here, we're in the fight. Let's just look at how everything looks. Let's observe it. Let's break it down visually. Big, big space here, right? This very clearly tells the player this is where the game happens because it is what the majority of the screen is. This is the game. Pay attention to up here. Fake physics also don't do conveyors. <laughs> At least if you do do Flappy Bird silly physics, just don't make games. Socks are banned. Don't do space physics either. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, so, visually speaking, this is very clearly saying high contrast, right? We get these really bright backgrounds against really dark colors. Our eye is instantly drawn over here. We know this is where we're supposed to be looking. We've got our main character and our enemies, and they all have very simple but good looking animation idle states, right? They've got um, squish squash, they've got follow through. Like, if you watch, I think it's one, two, three, like four frames of animation, but you kind of go up and down. And as you go up and down, your hands and your hair kind of trail behind you and all that. Geography Gamer, uh, for some reason, <laughs> for some reason that command is not working. Let me throw a link in and uh, fix that for you. I apologize there, friendo. Uh, we've, we've got the link over in the, the panels. But for some reason, our bot is broken. I need to fix that. So there you go. Thank you so much for uh, trying it. <laughs> it was a valiant attempt. So uh, good follow through on all the animation. Very simple. Four frames of animation. Not a lot, right? That's not like Prince of Persia, hand-drawn type sort of stuff. But it's there. And then in the background, we've got very simple animations as well to help this stay alive. We've got the leaves are the first thing that I noticed. Once again, it's like six pixels. That's all each leaf is. It's two lines that then, they don't even rotate. They just go along a trajectory. And that's super simple. Made each type of character have different idle animation loop length. That's a very good point, Risky Biscuit. Yeah. For something like this, that's very important. If you're building Crypt of the Necrodancer, it's probably bad. But for something like this, the right call. It's a very good point. I didn't even think about that. We've got the clouds moving in the background, kind of giving that illusion of parallax. And then we have a very simple waterfall animation, which is, what, four frames of animation? Once again, very simple, very simple animation there. And those three things, the clouds, the leaves, oh, and then we've got this kind of dust particle that kind of floats around every now and again randomly. One, two, three, four things really help the world feel alive. But... If we think about our Kurosawa film education, which I know we all have undertaken, we've all seen The Hidden Fortress, we've all seen good Kurosawa films, we know the importance of foreground, middle ground, background, and we can see the observance of that law here. We have the far background with the, with the uh, clouds, we've got more of the middle ground between the leaves and the waterfall and the players, but then the foreground we have these black silhouetted shapes. You can see that here, it's like a cutout of the world. Those things all layer together to bring us into it. We can feel that this is well made because of that foreground, middle ground, background. Okay, so that's just pure visuals. Um, aside from that, honestly, I think the icon design is like, it's serviceable, it's fine, but it's nothing outstanding. Like it does its job and that's it. Let's talk UI. So we said this is where the game happens, which is important that they did a lot of the game UI in this space. They could have said, you know, your dash cooldown is up here and enemy health is, you know, underneath or something. They could have put it in this black box instead. But it's really important they kept this information here because it keeps your eyes there. If you had to keep looking in other spaces, you would get tired. It would feel bad. That is called... Uh, Hicks Law. No, not Hicks Law. Fitz's Law. Fitz's Law says the uh, amount of effort required to take an action is equal to the distance that you have to move in order to take the action and the size of the target. So if I go from here to here, very low energy activation, right? Very easy micro moment because these things are right next to each other and they're really big. 
But if I want to go from here to the settings, I have to move way further, and it's a smaller icon. It's still fine, because I don't do the settings very often. But... Oh, little guy. Uh, but it's important to be thinking about when you're building your UIs and your, and your user experience. If I want people to take actions close to each other, then put them close to each other. Make the buttons chunky and large. Don't make them have to go pixel hunting. What do I feel about the health boxes? These green boxes, I think they're okay. Uh, obviously, it's very simple, right? But I think simple is okay. I think simple draws your attention and keeps it in the player sprites. And I could see a world where if this was more elaborate, that it would clash with it and it would draw attention away from the game area. So do I think there's probably a more visually appealing way to do this? Probably, but it does what's important. It organizes it. It's got it in rows of five. If it didn't have it in neat rows of five, if it was like six or four or seven, that would be a problem. Or if it had it all on one line, then you'd need some sort of quick differentiator, right? Some sort of line to say, like a vertical line to say, this is a group of five and this is a group of five. Hold on. Kid. A little bit darker over there for you. So, uh, that's how I feel about the hitboxes. This cooldown mark, it's not my favorite. In fact, it's kind of interesting. I just noticed this cooldown sprite is the exact same thing as the leaf. The leaf and the cooldown are the same sprite. They're just different colors. I never noticed that. I've been playing for like six hours, maybe, and I only noticed it because I was doing a deep dive. So that's that's an interesting point. Reuse your assets in a different context, in a slightly different way, people probably won't notice, and you don't have to spend the time making a whole new asset. Personally, I wasn't a fan of the cooldown mark. I wasn't sure what it meant until you told me. And that's exactly what I was about to get into, is this is not... Um, so, so in UX design, we talk a lot about being self-evident versus self-explanatory. And the idea being something that is self-evident is immediately obvious. Like, I can see here that this is like where this person stands. It is self-evident. Nobody has to explain it to me. Self-explanatory is I can like look at it and puzzle it out and I can figure out the explanation, right? So this isn't self-evident. I don't really know what this is, but I can click this and then swing. And now these have entered into a different state and I can kind of figure out, oh, okay, that's like the cooldown. So it's not great, it could be better, but also that probably took him 20 seconds to build. So, you know, get out of sleep and I'll be back tomorrow. Take care, Jack. Thank you for hanging out with us. Get a good night's rest. There you go, you're all set up. So, so yeah, the cooldown thing I think works but it could be better. Uh, these things down here, this is your deck. You always have your deck always available. There's no like redrawing or anything. So a deck is probably not a good mental model for it, but it's how I conceptualize it. I love how big and chunky these buttons are. It gives a lot of room for the artwork and big numbers, very, very legible. Those numbers, as much as I think kind of detract from the aesthetic and the fantasy, right? Like every time I look at this number, I remember, oh yeah, one damage, like I'm playing a board game. But I know exactly what is in here. It's incredibly legible. And so you can actually get pretty quick when you start going at this, you know, and it almost becomes like real time because you just start cruising through it. Punch, there we go, bow, shoot, you know, you can go pretty fast. Let's talk typography, though. Big, bold, all caps letters, right? There's no lowercase in here. And they went for that very bold sort of showdown feel. It's got these harsh angles that feel like a sword almost, like a cut. Uh, you could also talk about the fidelity of the pixels there, right? With the jaggediness kind of reinforcing that low bit aesthetic, they could have gone a more fancy, like, 
uh, script fonts, and that could have provided a different effect. But I think, once again, they were emphasizing legibility, and those sharp lines really reinforce, got to get on the A, on the W, on the V, on the E even, uh, really reinforcing that feeling of kind of danger and excitement and just action. Now, we also have this help icon down here, which I think is interesting. Toggle info mode. Because it's interesting because they recess it so heavily. You can see it's even got that little drop shadow there to say this is literally behind this. You don't need to pay attention to this unless you really want to explore it. And then you can kind of see all that, right? It's interesting. It's also interesting that they hide the lore pop-ups behind that button. Okay. So let's keep uh, going through this here. Uh, this uh, background as well. They could have done no background. They could have done a plain box. Instead, they made it look like an actual box. Like a... Like a I don't really know what it is supposed to be, but it kind of feels like a bamboo box of some sort. And I think that was probably very intentional. So knock this guy out before he dashes, pull our bow out, get our knockout punch, blam, blam, there we go, load up our sword, slash, move away, knockout punch, send you flying, bow, shoot, sword, slash, uh-oh, now I've backed myself into a corner. Reminds me of a Scrabble tray, I could see that for sure. Back myself into a corner here. This guy's going to dash at me. I have made mistakes because I started going too fast. I now have nothing to prevent this guy from attacking me. My arrow is on cooldown. I can't get over to him and, like, dash past him. He's going to hit me. So there we go. I took a damage. That's the fight. Now, let's talk about that transition. You saw the screen slide over, right? It wasn't a fade in, fade out. And even your character, I don't think, moved. I think that was just the background, like the room moved. Couldn't you have readied fireball? So it's not a fireball, it's a punch. So it, it wouldn't have, uh, I mean, you could have readied it, but it wouldn't have prevented the damage, right? And I think that those restrictions are what cause a really interesting puzzle. We'll get to the gameplay mechanics in just a second. Because uh, I'm, I'm in such a polished mode of thinking of like, how do they make this feel so good? Uh... So we get everything move in. We've got all those same background assets, right? All that changed, really, was this guy. It was only the foreground, I think. The background stayed in place. Okay. Thank you, Foolbox. Appreciate it. Uh, so now we can upgrade, right? We can remove a cooldown. I'm going to take a cooldown off of the knockback punch because my opinion is, like, in games, the more options you have available to yourself, the better, and the more mobility you have is kind of a way of expressing those options. So we're going to upgrade this, we upgrade it, and then I see, wait a minute, this is yellow now. Wait a minute, what are all those dots? I didn't notice those dots before, right? Oops. Oh, jeez. Well, all right, so there's now... <laughs> that's, that's one thing that I kind of like and kind of don't like. Those dots were saying this is how many upgrades you have available and how many you actually have used. And I think... It has the same problem as the dashes. It's simple, it works, it gets the idea across, but not until you kind of figure it out. So we're in this boss now. We get a change in music, right? Different music. We're gonna bait out the attack. Load up. Damage. Okay. And he's gonna call in reinforcements. So I'm gonna step back, load up the punch, and then try and make it so that this guy will be able to get punched. So I'm going to take this out of my dock, which I can do for free. Punch. Arrow. Lots of damage there. Load up my sword. Back up. Move forward. Slash. Um, can I dash past you? Good, I can, yeah. We'll turn around. Knock back punch. Oh dear, this is problematic. So I can knock back punch him into his buddy. However... He's still going to hit me. It's not going to get him out of the way. So I'm going to take damage here. Oh, man, he's not there yet. Mm, do I have any items? These are our potions we can use. I can heal, and that'll be helpful. I can essentially nullify the damage he does to me. Heal up. Bow. Slash, slash. Knockback punch. 
Uh, I'm going to wait because I want him to say I'm going to attack so that I can dash past him. Can you dash past again? You can, but it's on cooldown. And you can only go through one person at a time. Wait, no. You go through one person at a time, but you can still go through even if they're stacked up. So you're right, Mothman. I probably could have dashed past him and avoided the attack. Probably could have. Yeah. You're dead. I, I think you guys are right. I think you're both right. So here we go. Now he's flashing. That flash, once again, high contrast, signaling danger. They were already using red for, for the attack. So they can't flash red. So they went to the next level down of danger, which is yellow. So once again, signaling this is about to happen. That's pretty self-evident, I feel, that you know this is imminent now. Saw something like that in the control. Yes, yes, we do. So we can move right past him, and he dashes right past us. So we'll let him get close. We'll dash past again, and then unload. And I did that in the wrong order. The knockback punch needed to be last. Aaron TV, hello! How are you? We're doing an analysis of this delightful little indie game called Shogun Showdown. It is great. We spent a whole lot of time analyzing its UX, its visual design, its animations. Really good. Really good. Uh, we do have ads about to start, by the way. We'll pause, and then we'll do one... Uh, uh, a little bit more after that, and then we'll we'll call the call it quits for today. Thank you all for being here. This has been a joy having you all here. Just absolutely tremendous. We'll get our swords out. Oh, and the bow. I think the bow will kill him. There we go. Got him. That's the first boss. Getting over a sinus infection. I'm sorry you were sick, but I'm glad you're getting over it. So now we can add poison to one of these things and add a little bit of cooldown. So I'm going to put poison on our bow. So we can apply poison from a distance. That sounds good to me. So we can re-roll here. Oop. All right, here we go. Ads. Uh, whoa, Mothman, Centaur, thank you so much for the subscription. That's a couple more drops in, in the bottle uh, for my son. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Hope you're doing well. Uh, fish my seaport town yesterday with the layout no kidding okay Aaron TV um, do I know what you're working on have you told me before please tell me again I don't have it written down I'll write it down this time uh, Aaron TV what, what is this about a seaport town uh, you don't think you've been here before well fill us in what are you building uh, Toshiro Mifune, Tom, a man of culture. Thank you for the follow, Aaron. Thank you so much. We're a, by the way, we're a charitable organization dedicated to helping people develop the skill sets they need to enter the video game industry. We're doing that with myself, building games right now. Once I get a couple projects released, we're going to do extended game jams uh, with a cohort of individuals where they can learn from scratch how to build a game, get it out, publish, release, do revenue share, get paid for their time and get a portfolio item. So that's what we're all about here. We're in the early days, and your follow is directly contributing to that. Thank you so much. And Mothman, your subscription as well. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Tom Sutton, I I knew you were a man of refinement, and uh, uh, you, you just went straight to the Hidden Fortress reference. I love it. I love it. Um, very cool. Yes, we want picks. Absolutely. Wife Quest, hello! Date Masamune. Okay, so now that's one I don't know. Who's Date Masamune? Uh, regional ruler of Japan's Azuchi Momoyama period through the early Edo period. Edo period? Edo period? Heir to a long line of powerful daimyo in the Tohoku region. Uh, founded modern day city of Sendai. Interesting. Well, there you go. Uh, the, the deeper cuts get even deeper. Uh... I skipped your Samurai full box? Oh, darn it. Samurai Jack. Samurai Jack is a very, very good Samurai. Absolutely. Although, you know, I don't think I've ever actually watched the entire series all the way through. I've always been enchanted by the concept, but I've never, like, sat down and just watched all of it. I should. I should. Because uh, I just, I adore the concept. I love the concept. Uh, working on my first ever game for the last two years and four months from zero. Never made one before. That's awesome, Aaron TV. What are you making? What, what kind of a thing is it? He's got a big statue, Mothman uh, Centaur. Okay. Uh, he's the obvious choice, says Tom Sutton. 
In short, it's a 2.5D 8-bit Game Boy Voxel RPG that during the game it becomes a 16-bit SNES game. Okay, so kind of like Evo Land or something. Very cool. That sounds awesome. You'll be able to watch it with the kiddo in like five years, says Foolbox. Yeah, you know, we, the older one might actually be interested in that right now, maybe. more food. All right. Should we get back into this? I have a gif slash pick if you want to see what it looks like. I do. I do want to see what it looks like. Absolutely. We're all about uh, enabling and supporting each other's successes here. So please, by all means, share something. It's the same aesthetic as Powerpuff Girls. It's true. It's true. It is the same aesthetic as Powerpuff Girls. I don't think, I don't think she's ever seen a Powerpuff Girl. How it looks and its main mechanic. Let's take a look here. Oh, I've seen, I've seen you make this. You stream, don't you? I remember seeing this on a stream before and thinking, wow, this green uh, Game Boy aesthetic is rad. Hold on. Aaron TTV, you do stream. How am I not following you yet? I've seen your stream and I liked it. Shut up and take my follow. You're a much bigger channel than we are. What are you doing here? <laughs> Everyone, go follow Aaron TV. He makes cool stuff. I remember being in his stream, and it was rad. Go check him out. The green is trippy. Yes, I agree. It's And it's weird seeing that in a 2.5D aesthetic, because uh, I'm so used to just, like, you know, Mega Man or something having that style. Old, old, old Mega Man. So, very, very cool. Thank you for coming in and hanging out with us. I appreciate it. Used to be all my follows are from my old G Tarp days. What, what I don't I don't know what that word means. What what is that? So returning here once again, we've got interesting UI. Very simple, just a shade of white. It's probably not actually white, which is good. We have red, a, a dark shade of red, mauve, to indicate this is a negative. Be aware of this. This is not a title. You need to pay attention to this. Uh, GTA role play. Got it. Okay, very cool. Very cool. Uh, yeah, well, well, welcome on in. I don't, I don't do much uh, role play on the stream, although I do uh, play a lot of D and D. My dad was one of the original members of the D and D club back in the '70s at a private religious university, back when it was thought to be uh, Satan worship. So I've, I've, I've played a game or two of D and D in my life. Uh, so yeah. We've got that Mauve saying, look at this, pay attention to it. And then we have this, and I want to talk about this from a UI perspective. Let me get my head out of the way. So you've got the skip and the reroll. Skip is in a very clearly uh, disabled or, or a, a subordinate state. It's in a secondary state. It's saying, you probably don't want to click this, but you can if you want to. It enables on highlight, right? So you get that uh, white border and the whole button lights up. If you pay attention to it, like, it's really obvious in this arrow here. Very dark, now very bright. But what's interesting is the text doesn't change in brightness, right? So the text is completely bright, and when you hover over it, the button image gets brighter. That's important. If the text went away, it might feel more like it's disabled. I do a GTA roleplay because people say I have a good voice and should do voice acting for games. Nice, it's the closest thing to that. Very cool, very cool, man. That's awesome. Uh, Reroll, once again, also gets brighter. Kind of changes hue a little bit as well. But the text stays the same. Now, this here. We said this is a negative, so change the color. So you might say, well, this is a cost. Shouldn't the color be different? Or there should be some sort of indicator that it's a cost. Because this looks exactly the same as this. This is your total. This is the cost. It looks exactly the same but it's very self-evident what it means because of proximity. And that's a very important design principle to master. It's a lot harder than you may expect. Put things that relate to each other next to each other, and it will make contextual sense. So we're gonna upgrade our bow here. Also, very, very cool that the bow changes graphically. So it's not as simple as... Um, they, they graphically represent the change, right? So you get a green arrow here with the red fletches now instead of what it was before of the stone arrowhead. It's good. 
Looks like the outline sprites also as transparency to change the color of the button. Uh, solid color around, transparent in the middle. Could be. Yeah, it could be that this is pure uh, strength opacity. And then the middle is like a 5% opacity or something. Could be. The only issue I have with my game, says Aaron TV, is trying to make things understandable for the player with four shades of green. That is a very difficult design constraint. I don't envy you that. Um, design constraints b breed creativity, but they're also for sure constraints. I can't wait to see how you figure it out. Okay. So now we have a store. We get the same shrine. Once again, this shrine communicates we're going to improve an ability, reusing the same asset, but it's got a different background. It feels a little bit different. Cost right next to it. We know it's what it is. We've got a disabled button state here. This is the first time we've seen the button text being a different color, and it's very low contrast. In fact, I bet if you fed this through an accessibility contrast checker that it would it would fail. This probably would is not very visible to people with sight problems, but it's kind of okay because it's a disabled state. So, you know, it's not as important. We don't, we don't necessarily want people to even really have the button. So we can choose either, uh, or we can choose any of these things. We can uh, upgrade an ability for 20 gold, or we can buy a relic for 20 gold. Plus one damage to attacks if you moved with a tile in the same turn. So as I say, if you've readied a tile up above your head, you've got an attack prepped, and you move, uh, then plus one damage to attacks if you moved with a tile in the same turn. Does that mean it like loads up the tiles with more damage? So like, can I load up the poison arrow and dance back and forth and get like a 30 damage poison arrow? I kind of want to experiment with that and see if that's how it works. Let's do that. Um, once again, we've got very simple animations, maybe four frames of animation again. The fire might have actually more animation states, interestingly, but this up and down movement really calls your eye. It's got a lot of follow through movement, but then the background is completely stable. You see that there's no parallax, there's no leaves, there's no nothing. It's just solid. Uh, you can sell your life for money. Yes, it's just like the real world. Yeah. We don't see the fire. There's a fez in the way. There's the fire. You can see it. Yeah. Feels like there's a little more than four frames there. So we're going to move on. And then they have this map. The map slides up from the bottom. Everything else gets blacked out a little bit. A little uh, transparent black layer goes over it. And we have the map. The map has tiny little animations your idle state carries through, but it's a simplified version of the character, interestingly enough. And then we have these clouds going by, right? And these little watermarks that are also animating. All these things that are building a lot of life into this. Even though this didn't really need to exist, right? Like, you're just going to the next level. There's no choices there. You could have just said next level and moved. But they built this map and it feels more alive. The verisimilitude of the world is increased because of that extra element. Completely unnecessary, very cool. Oh, and you know what? I've still got chill hops going, darn it. Professional game streamer right here. Uh, Fortune's favorite, good to see ya. Take note, the water animation is just three frames, it looks like, thank you, appreciate that. And you can see we have a new background here. We've got the dust motes flying around, we've got the uh, waterfall once again. Very simple animations, the clouds sailing by. We've got these little stars, and I don't, don't think these stars change at all, but they could have. They could have done an intensity thing. And we've got water dropping, too. And then, once again, these good foreground cutouts, right? Really, really good. Uh, I like the little jumps of the character on the map. Yeah, yeah, I like it, too. Uh, which is actually just its walk animation. There's no walk animation. Like, if I move forward, that's how it walks. It jumps, and so they just repurposed it. Oh, I'm going to take damage here. Hmm. Uh, verisimilitude, asks Risky Biscuit. So verisimilitude is the feeling that a false world exists. So verisimilitude, you, you can call it world building. You can call it um, suspension of disbelief. It is the feeling that this is a real place, 
even though we know it's not. It's that suspension of disbelief. It's, I am willing to go along with this, even though I know it's not real. Verisimilitude. Uh, like it's a pawn in a board game. Exactly, yeah. And honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if this was originally intended as a board game. Like, it feels like a board game that they digitalized. Fox says words I don't know count to. Dash. Yeah, I don't have a dash, unfortunately. Um... Uh, and, and you can't dash through enemies backwards. Like, if I do this... So let's let's talk about that. That little screen shake. This is me trying to move backwards into the enemy. That's the error state. Tiny little screen shake. Not a lot, just a little bit, and then that sound effect. Burr, burr, burr. Very, very, very subtle. Uh, but just enough to t communicate to the player, bad, don't do that. And then while we're on the topic of sound design... You hearing that? It's that tiny little click. Click, click. It's good. Very subtle. Actually, if you have a game like that, it could be smart to market it as a game and a board game at the same time, like Wingspan did. Yeah, could. For sure. Especially if you've got, like, a publisher. Or you've done this a couple of times and, and you've got your feet underneath you, you know? Um, I'm going to turn around. And wait. There we go. Although I'm gonna get hit again here. This is bad, man. So he's poisoned, gets hurt. Load up my punch, move forward. I'm not seeing our relic do much. Plus one damage to attacks if you moved with a tile in the same turn. But like, moving is a turn. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. And then you saw that red flashing over there saying, hey, look, stuff is about to happen. Uh, we can drink our potion, our edamame brew. This guy's going to get us again. We are really struggling with uh, these spear guys. Load up the punch. Bait out the attack. Ah, uh, spear guy. Jeez. Um, punch you away bow, and I go before they do so I can shoot him before he comes in, and then get that guy. Alright. This was originally meant as a board game, says Fortune's Favorite, then there's likely an action economy where you can gain actions. Uh, I, there are free actions, so if you get one of these tiles that has like a red border background on it, then that means you can add it to your queue for free. That's the closest thing I've seen to like an action economy type sort of thing. Do the spears have longer reach? Yes, they attack for two tiles, whereas the swords only attack for one tile. And those two tiles, usually, like, if you're right next to them when they use the spear and you're not facing them, you're stuck because you can't dash through them and you can't move backwards. So you're just kind of in the water. All right, I'm going to go for about five more minutes and then we're going to do a raid. Strike the cell directly behind you. That's interesting. I think we need more mobility. Let's get the backward charge. So we can body slam into people behind us. Um, so I'm going to throw up this guy. Spin. Load up this. And then this. And then arrow. Slide back. Slam. Now I'm safe. He's poisoned. That guy died. We're all good. Get out of the way of the swords. I'm going to try and bait out this next wave. And then see if I can throw people into each other. There we go. Uh, take the hit, but he kills his friend. Arrow. Reposition. Ah, let's remove this. I don't think we want it. Let's just arrow. Uh, likely missed that, but was that indicated in the enemy's information? So that's actually a good question. How do we know what these things actually do? You kind of just figure it out. So, other than just figuring it out, it's this little button down here. And it says, hold on, let me get out of the way. Uh, no, wrong direction. Toggle info mode. Toggle info mode. So we can do that and then mouse over it and it tells us in text what it does. Strike the cells directly ahead and behind. But you do have to go through that. So it is 
you know, there's a bit of an obstacle if you want to look it up. That dash is really good with your relic. So, will this do, like, three damage? No, it doesn't. Yeah, I don't know what the relic does. Genuinely, I, I don't... I don't know what it does. Uh, you could have face left and use the back attack as movement. Probably. Uh, you move, so you should get a damage buff. I know, but like, I don't, I don't know what is buffing, and this is this is a point of communication failure. I don't know how to trigger this. Right? It says plus one damage to attacks if you moved with a tile in the same turn. So the problem is, oh, does it mean like, oh, I think I figured it out, even though it, it took me a minute. Kick you out. So if I do this, then this. I should dash back and then buff the other attack and do three damage with it. No, wait, okay. It didn't change the tile, but it did say three on there. So I think that's it. You need to use the dash with an attack. So if I dash, it will beef up the other potentially two attacks I have in there. I think that's how it works. So like start with the move thing, then do a bow attack. Exactly. I think that's it. I think that's it. That did three, so it makes sense. Yeah. It's just, it's very confusing. Uh, because with a tile can mean many things, right? If it said, if you moved or, or if you used a movement tile then like that would make more sense to me right but maybe that's just me I don't know so will this work if I don't actually move if I play a movement tile but I don't move do I still trigger the relic let's see no you do have to actually move okay this guy's gonna bot me, which is a bummer, but oh well. Okay, cleared, there you go. And then we can subtract a cooldown. And this guy, uh, let's do our dash, because we're gonna want that damage buff up a bunch. Get our upgrade, and we'll do this boss, and then I think we'll call it for the day. We'll, we'll jump in a raid. This cave is all I know, I am its shadow on the wall. So on that, by the way, did you hear the, the text sound effect? It's important. We've got a new, slightly different background with the eclipse there. Very good to indicate a little more drama. Okay. Dash back, arrow. Uh, I'm going to use my shield here. And uh, no, I'm not going to poison him yet. Not going to poison him yet. Reorder. Slash punch. Dash. Okay, he's gonna shoot spines up that hit two tiles away. So if I move forward, he should go into a state. There we go, we can do this. Ah. I was hoping I could uh, catch him out with this. Maybe we still can. There we go. Dash back, bow. There we go, nice. I'm gonna wait, load up the dash, load up the sword. Uh, we don't really want that there. I'm going to take that down so we don't have it off cooldown. Punch him out. Oh, and that was the wrong order. Darn it. Okay. Do this. We're going to bait that out and then dash away. And there we go. Easy game. Obliterated. That is one thing. That, that sequence, that good animation of the black bar going across, and then the text bashing it. Feels very good, very punchy. Um, you can analyze that frame by frame and get a lot of good stuff out of it. The text obliterated, very good. It feels very good because I took no damage during that fight. It's good to be recognized for that. Um, there's like three different states from what I've heard. There's obliterated, cleared, and survived based on how much damage you took. So now we can increase the level, which will give us an extra upgrade. That's Shogun Showdown. It's great. Definitely check out Shogun Showdown. There's a lot to be learned and analyzed from. See that little bounce that it's got. All of these little idle animations. Really, really good for having small effects have a big impact.